my name is Kieran O'Reilly, and I'm from Brisbane, Australia, and I'm presently in jail here in Texas, Texas uh, serving a year for um, a disarmament action on New Year's Day, 91, 15 days before Bush's deadline uh, for war. Um, a bit of my background is that I've been with the Catholic Worker Movement for 10 years, um, mostly in Australia, but three years travelling with uh, different communities in the United States. Los Angeles, Las Vegas, um, Jonah House in Baltimore, uh, communities in DC and New York, Philadelphia. <coughs> so I've been traveling for about three years now. Um, my attraction to the Catholic worker came out of my own experiences in Australia with nonviolent direct action against the preparation for war. Um, in Australia we have uranium mining, nuclear warship visits, American bases and targets nuclear weapon systems uh, and also involving the Aboriginal people. So out of this I developed a philosophy of uh, Christian anarchism, pacifism and um, I was very attracted to the practice uh, of the Catholic worker in North America and of Daniel and Philip Berrigan and the Plowshares movement. Uh, so that is the re one of the reasons I came to the United States was to learn of people who were much older than myself, who'd um, been involved for decades, who'd raised children in the tradition, who'd been in and out of jail to learn. And the other flip side was the idea of a need to be a missionary had always appealed to me. And um, I really felt that rather than go to the Philippines or to Chile or to Brazil or to El Salvador, um, the best idea for missionaries is to go to the heart of the problem the heart of the problem. The problem for this century has been <coughs> the empire of the United States. Uh, that is now the only show in town with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's an empire where 60% uh, of the world's population consumes something like 50% of the world's produce each year. And to me, uh, in any real sense, uh, that, that is the situation of global theft. And uh, that is the reason 40,000 children starve to death each day. And if that system is ever questioned seriously, um, uh, as with most robberies, uh, what is to maintain it is the armed force of the military. And that could be ranged from low intensity conflict, which has uh, ravaged El Salvador, say, in the last 10 years in the Philippines, or it can be the middle intensity conflict that we saw in um, Iraq last year, um, or it can be uh, nuclear warfare, which is the last card in the deck of what's known as escalation dominance, that the US, whenever it is challenged, will, let, will always escalate to the next level of destruction. And um, whether it's challenged by basic Christian communities, or whether it's challenged by those fundamentalists or nationalists, or um, Cuban Marxists or any group they want to withdraw from the US empire, uh, those groups will be smashed by the military. And um, so, as, as a Catholic worker, resistance to preparation for war is not just another issue, it's the central thing that maintains an empire of global debt and death. Um, it's the glue that holds empire together, the ability to kill people. And, and an ethical sense, uh, the clash between Christian teaching is that all human life is sacred, that no one is expendable, whether it's the unborn uh, facing uh, you know, death and abortion, or whether it is the undead on the Texas death row here who have been sentenced to death. But all those lives are sacred, and um, as well as you know, women who are pregnant or people who are threatened by uh, street violence. Every life is sacred to God, whereas for an empire, whether it's American or British or Egyptian or Roman, the ethic is everyone is expendable. Uh, even the president, John, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, was expendable to those self-appointed guardians of empire. And obviously the 40,000 children who starve to death daily are expendable. So that is why we focus um, most clearly on the preparation for war rather than uh, other issues as a priority, although we have a consistent ethic in terms of resistance to death penalty, to the abortion industry, to uh, poverty and homelessness, as you well know, the Catholic worker 
um, probably most well known for its act, practice of the Act of Mercy. So when I was in uh, the North East last year, uh, it became apparent as early as August we were actually out at the Pentagon doing the annual Hiroshima Day witness there uh, when Bush um, decided to send you know, hundreds of thousands of troops to the Middle East, the rapid deployment force that had been uh, created in the late 70s for just this purpose uh, was dispatched. Actually, that day Margaret Thatcher was also at the, uh, she was still in, in a job at that stage, uh, was at the Pentagon and uh, she was supporting Bush in this move. So it became obvious to us very quickly that it was an offensive military move, move that the rhetoric of Operation Desert Shield, of protecting Saudi Arabia from invasion, uh, was just thinly disguised um, rhetoric and that, that war was very much on the agenda from the word go. Um, this was confirmed in mid-September when we, coincidentally, we were carrying out a witness at the Sheraton Hotel in Washington, D.C. at the annual Air Force Arms Bazaar. And uh, Cheney spoke, I think it was on the Wednesday, and on the Thursday, uh, uh, Colonel, he was the Colonel, the General Dugan, of, uh, who was the head of the United States Air Force at that stage, was to speak on the Thursday. But on Wednesday, Dugan announced that uh, he said the two bombers being armed with an Israeli HAVNAV missile on the island of Diego Garcia, that downtown Baghdad had been targeted by the United States Air Force, and that, um, that they would be bombing civilian populations. Uh, so it was clearly apparent by September that the B-52 bombers would be used, as they had been used in Vietnam, to destroy uh, thousands and thousands of lives. So we... Um, Dugan actually lost his job that day, not for the, uh, the humane uh, policy of targeting civilian populations, but merely for making it public. Um, so a group of us began to reflect on our responsibilities as Christians uh, with this impending war. Uh, Diego Garcia is a, a side, uh, it's an island in the Indian Ocean where its 1,100 inhabitants was forcibly removed by the US military and flown thousands of miles to Mauritius, where they now live in ghettos, um, so that Diego Garcia could be converted into a military base for B-52s and eventually for the Trident submarine. So right along the nuclear war assembly line, whether it's the Cook of the People in, uh, in the South Australian desert where Oxby Downs uranium mine now exists, or whether it's the Shoshone people in the Nevada desert where the nuclear weapons are tested, whether it's the Diego Garcia, indigenous people um, suffer as a consequence um, in the preparation for war, let alone the unleashing of warfare, they claim the lives of Bedouins and Arabs uh, last year. So, <clears throat> with those responsibilities, we began to reflect on scripture, um, on the prophecy of Isaiah, and also on the times that we were in, on the history of the B-52 bomber, and, um, and, and to prepare a community of faith to, to disarm the B-52 before it could be used. So um, we, as a community, it took us about six months to form our community, uh, a number of retreats and prayer, and getting to know each other and questioning each other's motives and our own motives, and uh, making sure that our spirit uh, was authentic and to, to go into this action, which uh, it is a very, very dangerous action in terms of um, you're dealing with uh, an area usually that's heavily guarded by young men with automatic weapons, and you're, you're dealing with uh, the consequence of a long prison sentence. Uh, flash heads, people in the United States have been sentenced to, to um, times of one, three, five, eight, and 18 years. Helen Woodson is now in the eighth year of her 18 year sentence. So one has to not go into this process flippantly, but to prepare oneself spiritually for, for the action itself and for the trial and uh, for, the, for the prison sentence, as well as all the uh, family reaction that you get uh, during the process and all the other uh, cultural forces at play once you become uh, illegal. Um, so it was a very good pro process for us 
and by New Year's Day we were we were ready to act, and uh, we made our way to Syracuse, New York, and uh, then we made our way out to Rome Air Force Base, where, which is the B-52 base, and uh, in order, order to heighten our, our chances of actually carrying out the time that we broke into two groups, um, Moana Cole and myself is from New Zealand, that, that is why we call the Anthers Plowshares. I'm from Australia, Moana is from New Zealand. Bill Stride and Sue Franco are from the United States. Moana and I made our way onto the runway where we began uh, the work with disarmament. And we were to say quite clearly that this runway would not end at Rome Air Force Base, but would end in the deaths of thousands of children. And uh, we rode on the runway, um, no more killing of children. Um, Vietnam, Hiroshima, Middle East, or anywhere else. Uh, swords in the plowshares, and then we, we had brought with us blood from our community and ourselves, and caught a large cross on the runway. And then with sledgehammers, we began the work of taking up the runway in a very similar way to how people had brought down the Berlin Wall the year before. That one person uh, had to begin the process of slamming at the wall. It was still illegal to hit the wall at that stage with a sledgehammer. And the response uh, of police and soldiers in Berlin that night was to, uh, to join in the disarmament of the Berlin Wall. And it awoke the uh, civilian population to such an extent that all the hardware stores in Berlin sold out of hammers. And I guess that's the vision of the fascist movement that eventually around these, these death camps like Abilene or Griffith, um, that, that the hardware stores will one day sell out all their hammers. <laughs> So we worked, uh, surprisingly to us, we, we were on the runway for an hour and a half. Uh, we were past six times by patrol vehicles within about 200 yards. And uh, each time we would put our hammers down so they would not be mistaken as weapons and pick up our swords in the plowshares banner and wait for arrest. And the patrol vehicle would just continue by thinking we were workmen or something. So we'd pick our hammers up and by the end of it we were, we were well blistered and uh, pretty exhausted. Um, with our work at the time, and, and it, it felt uh, a spirit, spiritually uh, wonderful moment, you know, especially with you know, the dawn happening and uh, the full moon. But also it felt uh, like good physical work and a reminder that these weapons are put together through manual labour, um, through people going to their jobs day after day, and their sweat and their blisters putting together these weapons of mass destruction and these Air Force bases uh, of death, and that to bring these things undone, that it will require similar manual work and, uh, and sweat and whiskers, and as Dan Berrigan says, you know, the swords in the plowshare, the hammer has to fall, it's that simple, that we have to begin the work now, and that's really our understanding of prophecy, is prophecy is not uh, staring into a crystal ball and, and guessing who's going to win the races or something like that, the prophecy is uh, a two-sided thing, and that it, one attempts to look at trends that exist now, uh, such as the preparation for war, and project them into the future, and see dead children and dying children that exist now in Iraq, and one at the same time attempts to envision a future of peace and justice and bring it into the present now and flesh it in the present, and that is the dual side of prophecy. And as we were doing this, <clears throat> Bill and Sue had made their way into what is called the Deadly Force Zone, um, where this, the uh, three B-52s at that stage and for the last 20 years had been kept on 10 minutes ground ball alert. They were armed with cruise missiles and ready to fly. Um, the, the crew of the three B-52s were sleeping within about 300 yards of them, and that, was the, um, that had been the status quo. That, it only changed last year after the Gulf of the Soviet Union. So they began the, the disarmament of B-52 bombers. And uh, they managed to get about three to five minutes work done before they were discovered and they stopped as we were at gunpoint. And uh, in that time, they, they did enough disarmament work to keep that bomber grounded for six weeks. And uh, as well, the, uh, the SAC um, we closed the runway for an hour. <coughs> so at that point we were arrested and uh, held for about eight hours. Um, it was quite surreal actually. 
we're handcuffed and um, the, the MC claims were put at our head. Um, uh, one young man was screaming, have you got any bombs? And I tried to explain to him, no, we didn't have any bombs, he had the bombs and that's why we were there. Um, we were then taken uh, and, and separated and kept awake and exhausted for about eight hours before we were interviewed by the FBI. Um, Fortunately, we had re, re role played the most dangerous uh, parts of the witness, that is discovery uh, by people who are armed and also the FBI interrogation. So we role played it over and over and that, that proved very helpful not to uh, give away any information that might be, and, um, would incriminate uh, some of the support people or make any false moves that might uh, increase the chances of being shot. So the, those role plays can be very helpful. Um, well, just the uh, aspect of damage to the uh, so-called property uh, All right. justification of violating the law, so to speak. Okay. Um, right. Well, our, you know, <coughs> okay. uh, our hopes were, of course, that like the Berlin Wall, that people would join in and we would actually disarm the whole airport space. But unfortunately, we were, we were arrested and charged with uh, destruction of government property, um, initially at $80,000, uh, by most military estimates, was pretty overblown, <coughs> and uh, was eventually brought down and charged with conspiracy. So we spent the entire war in jail, refusing to cooperate with the bail conditions, which were, we weren't allowed to return to Griffiths or to break the law. We basically said to the judge that we can't put our conscience on hold as the the nation rushes to war. So when we were released on March 6, we um, began to approach these, what we found to be fairly ridiculous charges, uh, given the work of the B-52 bomber in the previous two months. B-52s dropped from uh, napalm, uh, the, the new uh, fuel air explosive, which is uh, the unleashing of this mist of fuel and then the igniting of it. Uh, and just, you know, I think we saw the results on the highway of death in the last two hours of the, the massacre there. People incinerated at the wheel of the vehicle. Uh, very similar to a low nuclear explosion. Uh, and also the notorious cluster bombs, which are these um, bombless the size of your fist that have about 600 metal shards in them. And they're placed into uh, cluster bomb units that contain about 600 of these bomblets and then they're dropped um, and before they hit the ground they explode and shred, you know, flesh and everything else. Um, so obviously to anyone with any uh, uh, normal common sense these, these weapons are illegal. Uh, they're illegal under the Nuremberg principles, the Geneva Convention, international law. They're illegal uh, under the biblical mandate that all life is sacred and thou shalt not kill, um, and, that, and uh, it's pretty much open season in terms of uh, the prophecy of Isaiah and Micah, that these are the, are the modern day swords that need to be beat into, sort of into plowshares, and that they're built at the expense of plowshares, that they're built at the expense of houses, of hospitals, of education, that in their very existence, whether they're used or not, they symbolise the theft from the poor. And unfortunately, if these weapons were used, the V-52 bomber dropped 30% of all the munitions dropped during the Gulf Massacre. Even though you didn't see it on television, what you saw was the, the high-tech hits of uh, the smartphones, which represented 7% of all the munitions. Uh, and of course, you didn't see the, the smartphones that missed. They were all censored out of the tape. So um, the V-52 bomber had been used between our, our actions um, not the one that we, we disarmed, but other B-52s were used between the time of the act of the New Year's Day and the court case. Um, international law says that B-52 bombers are not property, that they are, they are contraband, um, similar way to, to things like child pornography are not property, they have no protection under the law, uh, they're not property to human life. Um, so they have no defence, they should have no defence by international law or constitutional law or national law, and we attempted to raise those arguments during that case. The other defence we used in court was the necessity defence, which is quite legitimate under American law. It says that um, 
that you can break the law if you're uh, attempting to avoid a greater harm. And one has to prove that the harm is imminent, um, that the harm is, uh, that your action is in proportion to the harm that is threatened, that you have no alternative uh, but to break the law to avoid that harm. And um, there's another, another reason to believe you might be successful. Um, success isn't required, but uh, there has to be yeah, a relationship between the action and the removal of the threat. And we felt we could prove all those uh, requirements that the harm was imminent, that the harm had actually moved from imminence to actuality on January the 15th. The um, 52 bombings did take a massive amount of human life. That there was a relationship between our action and the removal of the threat. We did ground the B-52 bomb for six weeks, three of those weeks. Other B-52s were dropping a large amount of weapons. Um, so there was imminent uh, proportionality that we, um, the damage that we did with our sledgehammers uh, was proportional to the damage the B-52 bombers um, did during those two months or the one that we disarmed could have done. Um, you know, for example, we didn't drop a nuclear bomb on Griffith Air Force Base. Uh, we used blade hammers and, and household hammers. So that's in proportion to the damage that the B-52 bombers have done. In terms of no other legal alternative, uh, Ramsey Clark testified Unfortunately, the jury was removed during his testimony that um, this is a former Attorney General of the United States, so one would think that he was uh, uh, familiar with all the political alternatives that were to avoid the war. He testified that by January the 1st, there was no political means or lawful means to remove the threat of war. Um, and that this is a man who went to South Sudan to saying personally that attempted to see George Bush personally that had explored every political avenue open to remove the threat of mass destruction. So he testified on our behalf that we were correct in our, in our perspective that, um, that there was no lawful way of removing the threat. The, the, um, the federal judge uh, and prosecutor, it's like having two prosecutors really, <laughs> um, sabotaged under, under subsidy defense. And um, uh, it was... It was pretty disgusting, really, because um, this is this is their courtroom, and they say, you know, that they're um, they're accountable to things like the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees a fair trial by the jury of our peers, and the jury selection was very, very limited um, at a time when 90% of the population supported the war, um, and the U.S. Constitution guarantees the necessity of defence as a legitimate defence, and we were denied that. We felt that the jury should have decided whether we fulfilled the requirements of the of defense, um, not, not the uh, judge. Um, so we attempted at that point, once we sabotaged our necessity defense in the trial, to speak through our own testimony of, of the reasons of conscience that had brought us uh, into that courtroom. And uh, we did a pretty good job of that ourselves. Now, at the same time, our hopes were to use the trial um, not in an attempt to get off or escape the punishment or the consequences of our action, but to put the war and the weapon system on trial. That was pretty much our strategy in approaching the court. And it became a focus and a catalyst uh, for the community of Syracuse to continue resistance to war making. Um, because, as you know, after Bush's massive military uh, victory, uh, the peace movement pretty much collapsed. Uh, the debate about the war uh, diminished. But meanwhile, you know, the war was obviously still on for us. Um, we were heading to jail. The war was still on for the 200 military resistors who were being court-martialed in isolated places in the United States and Germany. The war was still on for the 200,000 children who were predicted to die in Iraq um, because of the embargo and the destruction. So we kept the, the war alive very much in Syracuse. And um, on three occasions during that trial, we returned to, to Griffith Air Force Base where people carried out civil disobedience and assistance. So uh, we felt that was very, very effective. And on the day of sentencing, 200 people uh, joined us in celebration of life and also resistance. Uh, we marched on the federal building, a very uh, colourful display of humanity, and um, 
reoccupied the military recruitment centers and federal buildings and uh, eventually went up into the courtroom uh, about a hundred supporters and we um, we challenged the court role in legalizing massacre and criminalizing peacemaking to such an extent that they removed a hundred supporters out and we uh, we ended our sentencing in prayer on the floor of the courtroom saying that we could not cooperate passively uh, with our criminalization so we felt that we carried the um, guilt force the integrity of the witness through from the action into the trial and then we were put in a police van and cut through shackles and put into a county jail actually the earshot of Griffith Air Force Base um, still in the one could actually see the 52 taking off uh, from Griffith and then after a while a few weeks with uh, Moana and Sue were sent to a small county jail in, in Holidaysburg it's a pretty sadistic name for jail Holidaysburg uh, Pennsylvania and Bill was sent to uh, a federal institution in New York. I was shackled um, hands, waist, and my feet and put on an airplane, um, I think it's called Con Air, and uh, flown from New York to El Reno where I spent about 10 days and then eventually uh, sent to Bakos, Texas, which is quite a surprise. So, um, uh, it was quite a journey being convicted on the Canadian border, or near the Canadian border, and now doing my time quite close to the Mexican border. So, um, getting to see quite the United States, I guess. Um, so, what one enters these actions with uh, a spirit of faith, but it's, um, we really have to, like the loaves and fishes, uh, offer the, what we have in a spirit of faith, and then it'll be multi and mystically multiplied and the ripples will go out and out and out. And uh, since being in prison, I've heard from people in the Philippines and in Ireland, England, Sweden, Denmark, uh, China, Guatemala, uh, throughout the United States, New Zealand, Australia, Fiji, who have been very much touched by this witness. And um, there's a real mistake in trying to codify the effectiveness of anything, which is what people tend to do when they're looking at the consequences of jail, I guess. So one enters jail in the same spirit that one entered the action and, and, and the courtroom to try and maintain um, this focus on peacemaking and, uh, and the witness to you know, the promise of Christ in, 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 amidst the history that at the moment looks very uh, uh, bloody and um, very tri uh, imperially triumphant uh, for Pax Americana. And it's been very interesting to do my time in Pecos uh, because the people I'm with, uh, whether they be Latinos or Arabs um, or Haitians, Guatemalans, Colombians, um, uh, Caribbean people, uh, Dominican Republicans, uh, Jamaican, are very much the people who are in the uh, the uh, hair sites or the rifle sites of, of the American military. And um, the reasons many of them are here in the United States uh, is that they're escaping the poverty that has been created by, by the empire, by the corporations that have, have plundered their country. So I'm very much um, been able to spend my time uh, with the victims of this system. And uh, that's, that's been a real privilege to, to learn from them there, to learn from there. Uh, simple humanity and their spirituality. Um, and uh, the, uh, I guess another thing about the, the prison experience is that it's obviously a very institutionalized place. So I think the Christian brothers for <laughs> all the training they gave me <laughs> surviving in such institutions. Um, but uh, one really has to maintain a focus on one's own self activity and prayer. And uh, you know, one attempts to create a certain monastic mode to the day, rather than just to be pushed along by the institution's timetable, is to create one's own uh, timetable of study and prayer and uh, correspondence and writing and exercise, and uh, you know, not just to veg out in front of the, uh, the television or whatever. And um, I found that very helpful um, to, to come into jail in a fairly disciplined way. Um, and to maintain contact with the 
I think the, the two things I think helps that helps one survive in jail is one's I mean, sense of spirituality and one's sense of solidarity with brothers and sisters uh, on the outside who are struggling for peace and justice and um, to, to maintain, maintain contact. Uh, however, with, with my initial community of Bill Sue and Moana has been very important. Um, and with the contact with the people I had in the northeast and now to meet people like Ken and uh, from Houston and Jane from Abilene, but that wherever they send you, whether it be Siberia or Paper, is that you'll always meet uh, people who are struggling for peace and justice. And that solidarity uh, is the flip side of the spirit, internal spirituality that one has to keep working on. And the, the IWW used to have a slogan in the 20s uh, that said, uh, we're in here for you, you're out there for us. And uh, it's very, very important to remember those who are in prison for peace and justice so to pray for them, uh, to invoke their names at demonstrations, to write to them. And it's, well, it's not um, such a big thing for me because I'm a single person, but when one thinks of Ellen Woodson, of uh, Captain Yolanda Bourne, of uh, Pete Rose, of, um, of other people who've got children, it's real practical support that one can offer uh, to prisoners of conscience. So the, the idea is what the state wants to do is to bury dissidents alive. It wants to erase them from your memory to pretend that they don't exist. And uh, it's a very conscious struggle uh, against that process uh, to remember those in prison. And uh, what a Kaibanunu is doing 20 years in Jerusalem in solitary confinement uh, for his exposure of Israel's nuclear weapons uh, plans and preparations nuclear war preparations. Uh, all these people really need to be invoked and prayed for um, by our families and our communities. And that's something I think we in the first world really have to learn of. You know, the Filipinos and the Irish and the Salvadorans and you know, all those other people who have been struggling for so long. So, jail also is the flip side of the B-52 in terms of the empire maintains its uh, control through the threat of violence. So um, the B-52 bomber and the military are usually there to control uh, the, the, uh, the, the empire <coughs> control order externally. Um, they'll fly to Vietnam or to Iraq to bomb, to maintain the, uh, the economic arrangements there, where prison and especially uh, the death penalty is there to maintain order uh, internally, and um, so jail is very much the flip side of the weapons. Um, and imprisonment in the United States is just out of control. Uh, the statistics released last week said that 1.1 million people are imprisoned in the United States, which is per capita the highest rate in the world. Um, apparently, uh, per capita, the U.S. imprisons five times as many uh, black men in South Africa. Um, so these are pretty serious statistics, and when you put that aside, alongside the fact the United States is one of the five countries that is prepared to execute mentally retarded people and minors, then in terms of imprisonment, qualitatively and quantitatively, and the U.S. is way out there in uh, terms of punishment. So these uh, these are stark realities that really confront with the. Uh, you know, the Disneyland self-identity of the United States. And um, one of the reasons I, I think it's important for people uh, who work for peace and justice to come to the Imperial Heartland and to evangelize here um, rather than going to the Philippines and Haiti, uh, where, you know, I mean, the Haitians and Filipinos look like they've got their act together in terms of the basic Christian communities. And uh, it's very much a struggle in places like Australia and the United States and Western Europe to struggle against a culture that, that um, is very anti-communitarian. I mean, in, in the third world, one has community is as basic as breathing. You know, so if you're going to survive the day, if you're going to get water, that you have to cooperate, you have to be a community. Um, it's not a big option. But in, in our culture, it's presented as uh, a threat to one's survival to be in community or to care for one's fellow uh, men and women. Um, so we're, we're pretty much in a very sick imperial culture. Um, 
It's bad for us spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, as well as bad for most of the world's population uh, physically. So uh, I think we have a responsibility as Christians to resist. As Carl Cabot has pointed out, uh, Christians are often affirmed, and Catholic workers too, in their works of mercy and feeding the homeless and uh, sheltering. Um, but when we, we ask, you know, why are these people hungry? Why are they homeless? And when we attempt to confront those corporations and institutions that create poverty, uh, we're not going to get any grants or any affirmations at that point. We're, what we're going to get is criminalization in jail. Yeah, I think like um, like the, the Gulf Massacre was very much uh, the first of the Third World War was to follow the 45 year Cold War of attrition uh, that defeated you know, the Soviet Empire and um, it's, it's really created a much more dangerous climate now. Uh, the American Empire is I think obviously in decline economically and has like played itself out. And um, you know, as Abby Hoffman once said, you know, the state will collapse under its own weight. All we have to do is give it a few kicks to stay high. But um, unfortunately, it's going to collapse right on top of and uh, take a lot of people with it. Um, and what the, the Gulf War seemed to be about is, um, the, you know, the creation of American hegemony or control uh, following the Cold War. Um, and. Now there is no deterrence. Like if the United States had moved on Iraq 10 years ago, they would have been risking all-out nuclear war with the Soviet Union, and uh, that's why they wouldn't have moved on Iraq 10 years ago. Uh, but now the U.S. can move at will throughout the third world um, without fearing escalating it uh, into a serious war with the Soviet Union or, or anyone else, really. Um, and as one point, person pointed out, you know, the, the two economies on the rise, the Japan and Germany, and that the Gulf War was basically about the U.S. isn't dependent on its oil coming from the Gulf. Most of it comes from the other side of Saudi Arabia and other sources. But who is dependent on Gulf oil is, is Germany and Japan. And the, the best explanation I've heard for why Bush went to all this trouble in the geopolitical sense is that at any given point in the future now, that the Japanese or German economies threaten the United States, they can uh, turn the oil off uh, coming out of the Gulf, and which is exactly what the United States did to Japan before World War II, before Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, it embargoed, put an oil embargo on Japan. So I think um, that's the best explanation I've heard for why, it, for why it did occur besides popularity ratings and uh, the idea of trimming Saddam Hussein's uh, military down, a military that had been built by Kuwait and the United States and by the Soviet Union and by Saudi Arabia to contain the Iranian revolution in the 70s. Um, you know, both Russia and America and the, the uh, royal families uh, in the Gulf feared an Islamic uh, revolution in the Middle East. Uh, so what they did after the Shah fell was to build up Saddam Hussein to uh, engage Iran in war uh, for eight years that totally exhausted the Iranian economy and the Iraqi economy as well um, to contain um, Iran. And it was time now to, uh, to trim uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, capacity to wage war without rolling him completely. So, um, that seems to be what's happened there. But any of the massacres like this could, could take place anywhere around the globe now uh, in terms of U.S. interests. And uh, it's quite ironic to be in jail here in Pecos because the, the town, the local town, is incredibly economically depressed, and uh, as is the surrounding area. And that, that's to do with the drop of the oil boom uh, in this area, which is directly related to getting cheap oil. Uh, from the Gulf. Um, so, you know, and the way the way these things play themselves out are the consequences of the felt uh, everywhere. And um, because the um, people who profit uh, 
from this system who happens to be getting to be a smaller and smaller group and richer and richer group of people uh, have control of incredible Im image making capacity. And the people in Pecos are a lot likely to blame uh, you know, Arabs or foreigners for their problems rather than uh, George Bush and the plutocracy that, uh, that runs this country. So, um, you know, they're, they're def we're definitely in some heavy, heavy times and um, the peace movement, I think, made some dramatic mistakes during the war. One especially was to organise around the self-interest of Americans uh, and to run under the slogan of no more Vietnam. And so I've been in this country three years and when Vietnam is evoked, what is evoked is the 50,000 Americans who died there, uh, not the three million Vietnamese who died there. They're, they're rarely mentioned at all. They say if they, if they build a Vietnam memorial to the Vietnamese who died in that war, it would reach the Washington Monument from where the President Biden was built. So, um, to organize around self-interest is really self-defeating. And uh, Bush, Bush agreed with the slogan of the peace movement. He said, yeah, no more Vietnam. And what he delivered was a Hiroshima. And they dropped munitions equivalent to seven Hiroshima's there. And they raised the ratio of the Vietnam War, which was 50 dead Vietnamese for every dead American, to 1,000 dead Arabs for every dead American. It was basically Hir Hiroshima all over there. And uh, we have to be very careful when we're organized to organize around um, morality <laughs> and the sanctity of life and an analysis of what causes war and uh, maintain such a system of injustice that it starts with 40,000 children each day without a shot being fired. We have to really deepen our analysis and not try and go for any quick fix self-interest slogan like, like the peace movement did last year and which actually led to the decimation of the peace movement. By the end of February, the peace movement was pretty much exhausted and defeated, um, which was one of the main reasons we decided to accept bail and come out. We felt we had to play an evangelical role amongst, amongst uh, a demoralized movement um, and to share with them the, the excitement and the hope of experiencing disarmament even in these very bad times. So um, I, th I think that's very important as we uh, we get ready to face the rest of the 90s and the, and the next century um, um, in, in waging peace. Um, there's no, you know, there's no mystery candidate out there <laughs> in New Hampshire at the moment who's going to bring about peace or anything like that. And uh, our church hierarchy is so co-opted, which is you know, it's pretty much a story since Constantine. Um, uh, that you know, what really occurred with our church was what Jesus went through in the first temptation, is that he was tempted to bring in his kingdom by using you know um, economic power, the creation of bread, political power, the control of the kingdoms, or the power of magic and mystery by jumping off towers. And the devil tempted him to use those means not to do evil things, to become hedonist or anything, but to bring about his kingdom in a quicker way, a more effective way, by using these, these means. And Jesus rejected those means of power, and he called together a community of, um, of people uh, to incarnate the vision now. And uh, our church hierarchy and are continually and embraces these uh, temptations of economic, political, uh, and the power of mystery and magic uh, over and over again. And uh, it gets co-opted and ends up blessing bombs and, and serving Caesar, basically. So um, uh, I, I intend, to, I'm a Roman Catholic, I intend to maintain, to remain in the tradition. Um, and uh, I hope you folks do too. And, uh, and to maintain a position of or create a tension between uh, our tradition and the bureaucracy that maintains the libraries in Rome or whatever it does that's useful and the prophetic and uh, I think that's a very exciting place to be in that creative tension between the tradition and the prophetic and, uh, and so that's what I'm hoping to do with the rest of my life. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks a lot.